Hello, I'm Scott Friedman. I've been playing paddle tennis for over 20 years. Because of the game and my love for it, I've been able to travel throughout the United States and many parts of Europe. I've made a little bit of money, but mostly important, I've really had a lot of fun. It's the challenge of the game and the performing for an audience that makes paddle tennis the exciting but relaxing experience that it is for me. I learned the game by watching all the game's great players when I was a junior player growing up. You too can learn from professional teachers. With the aid of this video and text, you can learn quickly and correctly by concentrating on what you need to know. If you practice conscientiously, you can learn this great game effectively and have a great deal of fun. Paddle tennis, anyone can play, is designed to provide the skills necessary for the student of paddle tennis to progress from beginner to intermediate and beyond, with focus on a complete understanding of the basics. Careful attention has been given to laying the foundation for a successful paddle tennis career. The techniques described in the video and text have been found after many years of playing and instruction to be the easiest and most effective way to learn the game. In addition, I have provided pertinent information about the history of the sport, all the game's special rules, and information useful for instructors of paddle tennis. The video and text feature the 10 basic lessons of paddle tennis, lessons you must learn to become a complete player. Through hard work and strict discipline, I learned and mastered each one of those lessons one by one. I would practice each lesson one at a time until I felt totally comfortable. Then I would move on to the next one. This material is not meant to be learned overnight. Take your time with it. First, by reading the text and fully understanding each technique described in it. Then, pop the video in. Now, visually, you can begin to see what you've read, learned, and imagined in your own mind. By learning and mastering each technique described in the video and text, I've been able to win more all-around professional paddle tennis tournaments than any other player in the history of the sport. I've also copped my sport's highest honors by being the number one ranked player in the world several different times. I'm a national men's singles champion, a national men's doubles champion, and I'm a national mixed doubles champion as well. And I'm the only men's player ever to have captured all three of these major championships. As you learn to play and your game continues to improve, I'm sure you'll find, as I have, that paddle tennis is a challenging and engrossing game that you can enjoy throughout your lifetime. So good luck, enjoy the video, and let's get to it. Paddle tennis, for the most part, is very similar to that of regular tennis. Most of the game's strokes and techniques used in paddle tennis are the same ones used in tennis as well. A paddle tennis court is about one-third the size of a tennis court with a net that stands at about 31 inches high. The scoring in paddle tennis is pretty much the exact same as the one used in tennis as well. There are a few basic rules in paddle tennis that you need to know before getting started. Each ball must land within the 20 foot by 50 foot boarding areas. Any ball that lands outside of this area is considered an out ball, resulting in a loss of point by the team that hit it. The second basic rule is, in singles play, the server may not approach the net after he's been successful with his serve. Unlike in tennis, the server can hit the serve, come in behind it on an approach shot, and volley the ball. In paddle tennis, the server must wait until the receiver contacts the ball once and the ball bounces back in his side once. Then the server is allowed to go to the net if he chooses. The special bucket line rule for doubles in paddle tennis is what makes the game a little bit different than tennis. In paddle tennis, there's a bucket line in the middle of the court that extends 12 feet from the net. When the serving team's getting ready to play, they serve the ball, they're now approaching the net. Neither player, me nor my partner, can cross this bucket line in the air or on the line from the ankle down in any way until the service returner has made contact with the ball one time on his paddle. Again, as we're approaching the net, we cannot cross this line in any way from the ankle down until the service returner has made contact. For the receiving team, the same thing goes. When the service returner is preparing to make that service return, his or her partner at that point, the poacher, also cannot break that plane of that line until his or her partner contacts the ball as well. The official paddle tennis paddle is 17 and a half inches long 
by eight and a half inches wide. It's made of a solid material, generally wood or fiberglass or a combination thereof, with an outside bordering rim made of aluminum. One of the major differences between paddle tennis and tennis is the ball. The ball used in paddle tennis is the same exact ball as the one used in tennis. The only major difference is, is that a ball in paddle tennis, some of the air is taken out. To achieve this pressure, simply take a hypodermic needle or a safety pin, stick it in the ball, listen for the air. When all the air has come out of the ball, give it one small squeeze with your thumb. Take the pin out of the ball, to test to make sure you've achieved proper pressure, simply take the ball from a height of six feet, drop it, it should bounce back up to your waist. Let's see what happens. Perfect. Warm-ups play a very important role in paddle tennis. Before you start each game of the day, or before you start each set, if time allows, you should concentrate on getting a very good warm-up. There's a five minute basic warm up for both doubles and singles that will get you along to establish your rhythm and timing without having to feel the pressure of an actual point during the game. The doubles warm up concentrates a little bit more on the volleys of the game while the singles warm up concentrates more on the ground strokes of the game. Let's start with the doubles warm up. The first position you'd want to be in is one player is positioned at the net while, one, while his partner or opponent is positioned at the baseline. The player at the net should concentrate a little bit more on working the volleys, moving the feet, establishing that rhythm and timing, because this is a very high reflex tight shot. The player at the baseline concentrates a little bit more on the ground strokes with the footwork, establishing his or her rhythm at that time as well. The second position you want to be in is the player from the net now moves to the bucket line. The player at the bucket line now establishes his timing or her timing and rhythm with concentrating more on the long range volleys of the game. Now they're working a little bit more on their individual techniques, such as the racket back, the arm turn, the step, and the follow through. While the player at the, at the baseline is concentrating a little bit more on his or her ground strokes, as well as starting to move a little bit more now on the court. The third position you want to be on is now at the baseline. The player from the bucket line moves to the baseline to start establishing his or her rhythm with the ground strokes, while the player at the baseline on the other side now comes to the net and starts to establish his or her rhythm with the volleys. The fourth position you want to be in is the overhead smash. Concentrate a little bit more now with working your shoulder a little bit more easy. You don't want to start too hard with the overhead. For the first three or four overheads, go nice and slow, just relax, get a good feel for the ball, and then on the fifth or sixth one, you can start going for more of the full range motion overhead. The last and final position for the doubles is both players come to the net at both ends of each bucket line, and now they're concentrating a little bit more on the reflexes, concentrating on developing their footwork and timing and rhythm, establishing all that, again, without having to feel the pressure of winning or losing a point during an actual game. In singles play, you should concentrate a little bit more on the ground strokes. The ground strokes, you know, basically the forehands, backhands, establishing your timing, your rhythm, your footwork, getting a good feel, loosening up your muscles, as well as getting that good timing down. One player is positioned at the net, and the other player is positioned at the baseline for the actual second position of the singles warm-up. The player at the baseline is now concentrating on his her, or her forehand or backhand ground stroke, while the player at the net is concentrating a little bit more on those reflex volleys that we talked about earlier. Now, the third position you should be in is the player that is now at the net moves to the baseline, and the player at the baseline now comes into the net to concentrate on his or her volleys at this time, while the player that was in the net before, now at the baseline, is starting to concentrate on his or her ground strokes. The last and final position is the overhead smash. The overhead smash, again, like we talked about the doubles warm-up, should be started very slowly, with nice, easy timing and rhythm, concentrating mostly on getting good full range motion. If you want to play well and win, one of the most important requirements is holding the paddle properly for the correct stroke. There are three basic types of grips in paddle tennis. The Western, the Continental, and the Eastern. I prefer the Continental grip for paddle tennis because it requires no grip change between the strokes, which could be a very crucial factor in a fast game like paddle tennis. To hold the Continental grip properly, spread your fingers nice and comfortably. Now, take the racket in a handshake-like position. The racket should be held mostly with the index and middle fingers. 
Between your thumb and index finger, there's a V that forms on top of your hand. Line that V up with the rim where it comes into play with the handle. Now you're in the proper continental grip position and ready for the stroke. The first position you want to be in for the forehand ground stroke is the ready position. The ready position is the starting point for all of the game's strokes. The ready position simply is your feet are spread about shoulders width, you should be up on your toes and your knees slightly bent, nice and balanced. Your racket should be held up, pointing upwards about waist level. Now you're in the proper ready position. The first movement you want to make as soon as you see the ball coming off your opponent's racket is the backswing or racket back. Take the racket back prepared below your hip, preferably about six inches below it, and below the oncoming ball. Your racket should be prepared and ready to go by the time the ball is in front of you. The second position you want to be in is the turn. You want to make sure you get a good arm turn with your front shoulder really turned around towards the oncoming ball as if you were going to catch it. So, racket back, arm turn. The third position is the step. When you step to the oncoming ball, you should be stepping at a 45 degree angle not too far in front of your body, causing you to be off balance or out of control. Remember that when you get the racket back and your arm is turned, you're stepping towards the oncoming ball. Now, as you're preparing for your contact with the ball, your racket is still prepared six inches below the hip, lower than the oncoming ball as well. On contact, it's up on contact, up the back side of the ball, and over on follow through. The reason you want to come up the back side of the ball in the contact is to cause that topspin effect that you get when you hit the stroke in its actual motion. Again, racket back, the turn, the step, the fourth position is the contact, now the follow through. When you're just about to make contact with the ball, it's up on contact, the back side of the ball, and over on follow through. There are two major reasons why people miss shots on the ground strokes. The first reason why a person hits the ball in the net is because simply when he's preparing his backswing, the racket is prepared too high above the ball and it for forcing him to hit in a downward motion. Remember that when you prepare the racket, it's got to be below the ball. So you take that short step, now it's up on contact, lifting over the net and over on follow through. The second reason why people miss it, the ball long out of the court is because simply the racket is prepared too low below the ball. They let the arm hang down too far. By the time they're getting ready for the contact, they make their contact out in front of them, but now they continue to hit the ball in a, in a flag saluting type position. It's very, very important that when you make your contact and follow through with the ball, that you come up the back side of the ball in contact and over on follow through. Now, let's see the shot in actual motion. Like in the forehand ground stroke, the backhand ground stroke also starts in the ready position. Just to do a brief summary of the ready position, your feet should be spread about shoulders width, balanced up on your toes, knees slightly bent, and racket held up about waist level. The first actual physical position or the movement that you're going to make is you're going to have the racket prepared back just like in the forehand, but this time you're going to take your left hand and cup it under the racket where the rim comes into play with the handle. Take that back, pull it back about six inches to the back of your hip. Now, in this particular stroke, you don't have a left hand or a guide hand to pull your opposite shoulder around. So you really need to get that racket back down low, below the ball, prepared early as the ball's coming off your opponent's racket. As you take the racket back down low, below the ball, you begin to step towards the ball. Make sure you don't overstride or step too far, causing you to be off balance again, just like the forehand. So, racket back, down low, below the ball, knees slightly bent, step to the oncoming ball, 45 degree angle. On your contact, it's very, very important to establish an early contact point in the backhand ground stroke. Simply take the racket from the low position and it's up on contact, over on follow through, but you must make contact with the ball six to 10 inches in front of your front foot. Again, racket back, down low, below the ball, Step 45 degrees, 
up the back side of the ball in contact, just like in the forehand, and over on the follow through, making contact six to 10 inches in front of your front foot. Now, let's see the stroke in actual play. The service in paddle tennis is what makes the game such a unique game to play. Everybody can do it. It's an underhand serve that must be contacted no higher than 31 inches or lower than the average person's waist. In tennis, when you try to master that serve, it takes so long just to get that ball up and to have to come all the way through the ball, down hitting the ball 80 feet into court. In paddle tennis, you're roughly working with about 25 feet of court. What you want to do is you want to take your back leg, almost like you're in a walking position, put it right behind your front leg. All your weight should be nice and firmly balanced on the back leg at this point. It comes down to basically three basic steps, the bounce, the step, and the contact. It's very, very important that when you bounce the ball, you should bounce the ball about 10 to 12 inches in front of your front foot. When you step, again, you step in a 45 degree angle, nice and short step this time, not long, causing you off balance. And your contact should be met with the ball roughly 10 to 12 inches in front of your body, leaning forward. Again, three basic steps. Bounce, step, and contact. Now, let's see the service in actual motion. Now that you've been successful at your service and you're ready to approach the net, the first position you want to be in is the ready position, again, like the game's other strokes. The ready position, again, remember, is the starting point for all the strokes of the game. The ready position, as far as the volleys are concerned, are a little bit different than the ground strokes. Remember, in the ground stroke, we learned that in the ready position, the racket's held up about waist level. When you're approaching the net for the serve and volley, you need to get the racket up in ready position about eye level. This will enable you to get the racket any way you want with one movement, without having to bring the racket up from here, then move. Again, remember the serve. Bounce, step, contact. The first position after your contact is the ready position. You should be running or approaching that onto the same level as the oncoming ball, so you don't have to move down and then react. Again, ready position up at eye level, running to the net to the same level as the oncoming ball. The first position that you want to be in as far as movement is concerned is the backswing. You should take the racket back as the ball's coming to your shoulder. Make sure you don't bring the racket back any farther than the shoulder. If you do, that would be considered a swing resulting in loss of control, power, and timing. Again, bounce, step, hit on the serve, racket comes up, ready position, you're on the same level as the ball. Racket comes back to the shoulder, 45 degree angle, not behind it. Now your left hand swings around as if you're going to catch the oncoming ball, literally. The reason for this is this gets your body turned all the way around so you can able to step at a 45 degree angle. Now you're fully prepared for the volley. One more time. Bounce, step, contact in the serve, the racket comes up, bring the racket back to the shoulder, left hand around as if you're going to catch it, a short 45 degree angle step, not too long, causing you to be off balance or out of control. Just a short step. Now, as the ball is approaching and you're about to make contact, it's very, very important that you make contact with the ball in front of your front shoulder, preferably six to 10 inches. This will get, since the ball's traveling at such high speeds, it enables you to get a good, solid contact with the ball going forward. If you let the ball come back into your body, chances are you're probably gonna swing at the ball and lose control. Again, one more time. Bounce, step, contact. Racket comes back to the shoulder, left hand around, step, pull, contact, 45 degree angles, 6 to 10 inches in front of the front shoulder, pushing the ball deep to the deep man. Now, let's take a look at the shot in actual motion. The major difference between the volley from the bucket line and the servant volley is that the volley from the bucket line is contacted from a standstill position, while the servant volley is contacted in motion. 
However, they both pretty much require the same techniques described. The volley from the bucket line starts again, like all the game's other strokes, in the ready position. This time, the racket is positioned up about eye level in the volley ready position. Now, as you're watching the ball come off your opponent's racket, the first actual movement you want to make is the preparation or the backswing. When you take the racket back, just like in the serve and volley, you take the racket back to the shoulder length. Make sure you, at this point you do not bring the racket back any farther than the shoulder. If you do, again, that's going to be considered a swing, loss of control, timing, and power. So, ready position, racket back one, here comes the ball, you spot the oncoming ball, the left hand swings around, bringing the shoulder and the body around, as if you're going to literally catch the oncoming ball. At this point, you want to take a nice, short, 45-degree angle step, again, not too long, causing you off balance to lose control and power. Racket back, turn, good short 45 degree angle step. As the ball's coming in, it's very, very important from this volley from the bucket line that you contact the ball six to 12 inches in front of your front shoulder. Again, racket's back, the arm is up, you've got your 45 degree angle short step. Now the ball comes, you slightly pull away with the left hand as the racket comes through at a 45 degree angle contacting the ball 6 to 12 inches in front of you. Again, very important to have the racket up watching the ball. Racket comes back, left arm around, 45 degree angle step, pull, contact 6 to 12 inches in front of your body. Now, let's see the actual shot in motion. Now that you've been successful with your volley from the bucket line, it's very important once you've forced your opponents backwards to come to the net. Your opponents are now on the defensive. The ideal position when approaching the net, you should wind up about a racket distance and a half a step away from the net. You must understand that the nature of this volley is hit at you at very high speeds, sometimes in excess of 90 miles per hour. It's very important to understand also that when you make your contact with the ball, that you contact the ball in a downward motion instead of pushing out on the first volley. Also, make sure that you contact the ball 6 to 12 inches in front of your front shoulder. Now, you'll start in the ready position. Again, the racket is held up about eye level. You see the ball coming off your opponent's racket. The first actual movement you'll make will be to bring the racket back to the shoulder. Again, make sure, especially on this volley, that you do not bring the racket any farther than the shoulder because now you're letting the ball come into your body, causing you to be late, losing power, timing, etc. So, racket up, racket comes back to the shoulder, left arm swings around as if you're gonna catch the ball again. Take that short 45 degree angle step that we talked about on the volleys. Now, at this position, it's very important to have the racket already positioned at the front shoulder level. Instead of bringing it from the back shoulder forward, you should have it pretty much positioned in front, right where you're going to make your contact. So from this position, you'll simply take the left hand or the guide hand, pull it away, and bring the racket through in a downward motion. One more time. Ready position. Racket back. Turn. 45 degree angle step. Pull, keeping the ball in front of you. Make your contact 6 to 12 inches in front, hitting in a downward motion towards the ball. Now let's take a look at the actual stroke in full motion. One of the major advantages a doubles team can have is the poaching opportunity that's set up by a good, hard, low, consistent service return. For poaching, the first position you want to be in is the ready position, which is the starting point for all the game strokes. The ready position for the poach simply is, is the racket's held up again like the other ready positions, but this time a little bit at waist level with the knees a little bit more slightly crouched. The first position the poacher's in is he's watching the ball coming off his opponent's racket. As the ball comes off, it goes into his partner's racket and his partner makes the service turn back. He continues to follow that ball all the way back over the net. The first physical movement he wants to make is he wants to take one aggressive step into the court. This will enable him to react any which way. From this point, it becomes a simple volley. He sees the ball coming up. After a good, hard, low service return, he follows the ball. The racket goes back. 
the arm comes around and he takes an aggressive step, again, 45 degree angle, but towards the net and contacts the ball hitting down into opponent's court. The most important part of the poach is to remember is that the poacher is putting a lot of pressure on the serving team that's coming to the net to volley. It forces that volleyer to really get that ball by him. He's under a tremendous amount of strain at this point when the poacher is covering half the court. So keep in mind when poaching, always make your contact with the ball in front and hit down into your opponent's court. The overhead smash is one of the key factors at winning at paddle tennis. You must learn to develop a good overhead due to the nature of the court. Because this court's so small, a lot of times players are forced on the defensive and lob balls. But the unfortunate part, like in, in tennis, they have a big court to work with. You can hit angles all over the place in tennis. In paddle tennis, it's very difficult to put the ball by someone because of the shortness of the court. An overhead is simply a ball that's contacted over your head down into your opponent's court. The most important part of the overhead is anticipation, is knowing when the other team is going to lob. Watch. I'm in the ready position. That's the first position you want to be in. But the racket this time is held pretty much about, I don't know, chest level. OK, let's say in between the waist and the shoulder. Now, as you see the ball go up, the first position you're going to get into is you're going to drop your racket down below the waist into a ready position below the waist and you're going to take your first step on your back foot or your right foot and plant all your weight on that foot. This helps you keep the ball in front of you and helps with the balance in the shot as well. The first most important thing to remember for the overhead is always keep the ball in front of you. Never let the ball slide behind you so you're having to hit up on the overhead. It's important that you make your contact with the ball in front of your body for maximum power and strength and control as well. So, start in the ready position, okay? You see the ball go up, as the ball rises, your racket begins to drop, and your back leg, take a step back, all your weight comes back. The first actual position of the racket will be positioned about six inches behind the top of your head. Take the racket behind here, now the racket's in proper position. The arm swings up as if it's pointing exactly towards the ball. This will help you with some balance and control as well. As you have the arm up, the first movement that you're going to make is that you're going to pull down as if you're pulling a chain. You pull down with the arm and you bring the racket through. The most important part of the contact is to transfer the weight from the back foot to the front foot. Watch. The racket goes back, all the weight shifts from the front foot to the back foot. Now the racket prepares behind the head, six inches above it. The left arm goes up. Now at this point, the ball's about two feet in front of you. You want to try and contact the ball at its highest point, OK? So racket's prepared, arm is prepared, all the weight's on your back foot. At this point, transfer the weight onto your front foot as you're pulling down that imaginary chain. And the racket comes up at its highest point, contacting the ball straight up above the ball, hitting down into your opponent's court. There's three different types of angles that you can use in paddle tennis. For the cross-court overhead, you want to try to surround the ball. You don't want to go too far around the ball like this, pointing outwards, because now the ball is going to continue to move around you, and you won't be able to get the full control and power of the shot. So for, a, for an overhead that you want to hit cross-court, simply take the racket back again in the ready position, but now slide your front foot back just a little bit around the ball. Now your body has shifted from the center of the court to cross court. Again, racket back, six inches above your head, arm points at the ball. You're now surrounding the ball here. As you pull down, you make your contact in front of the left side of your body. Boom. At its highest point, straight down across your body with a good follow through. For an overhead down the middle, which happens to be pretty much the easiest overhead, but yet can be the hardest in a doubles game because both players are covering the middle of the court because of the smallness of the court. Watch. For an overhead down the middle, you simply take the racket back down low, below the waist in the ready position. Racket comes up again, six inches behind the head. Left hand slides up, pointing exactly towards the ball. But now, instead of stepping back and surrounding the ball, 
you're simply keeping the weight on the back foot at this point. Racket's still prepared, arm is pointed. Now you pull that imaginary chain. As you pull the chain, the weight begins to transfer from the back foot to the front foot. Pull down, make your contact now with the center of your body, reaching straight up in front of your body, straight up right in the center of the racket, top half of the ball straight down through the center of the court. For the third angle and final shot, it's very important that this shot must be contact in front of your body. So many times I see so many players, beginners, and even top professionals do this. They get the ball in front of them, and because this nature of this ball, because of the nature of the shot you need to hit in front of you, they let the ball slide behind them, and now they've lost their control and balance. It's very important, very important in this technique to keep the racket balanced behind the head. Don't let the racket dangle too far down because now you're going to be late. Again, start with the normal ready position. Racket's down low, below the waist prepared. Weight's on the back foot. Racket comes up. But now, this time, you're going to take one little small step to the left with your left foot. Now, this will get the ball two feet in front of you like it's supposed to be. At this point, you reach up to the ball, grab that imaginary chain. The weight transfers from the back foot to the front foot. And now, you're hitting this ball pretty much in the center of your body to a little bit on the right. Catch the ball in its full height right there, making contact, again, to the center of the right side of your body, down through your body. Once again, cross court, cross your body, straight down through, down the middle, the center of your body, pull the chain, come through, and for the angle on the other side, simply take that step with that left foot, get that ball in front of you, make sure it's in front, and really come down the center to right side of your body, following through all the way. Now, let's take a look at all three angles in motion. Lobbing and retrieving, when worked through with patience, can become a very significant factor in your game. Oftentimes in paddle tennis, because of the nature of the court and the size, you're forced back on the defensive by your opponent's a good, hard, deep volley. Really, the only thing to do in this situation, rather than hit a desperation ground stroke, come up with a good lob if possible. The lobbing starts in the ready position, as like all the other game strokes starting point. When you start in the ready position lobbing, it's a little bit different because at this point you don't know whether or not you're going to be lobbing because your opponent hasn't hit the ball yet. But once you see your opponent's ball come off the racket, now you know that you're going to lob because you're starting to be forced backwards. The first position you want to get in movement is to bring the racket back. In a normal ground stroke, you bring the racket back to the hip. But in lobbing, you want to bring the racket down a little bit lower than the knee, again with the racket lower than the ball. It's very important that you get the racket kind of semi-horizontal to the ground with the racket coming under the ball. It's very important when you make contact as well with the ball that you contact the ball in an upward motion, actually as if you're saluting the American flag. You make your contact and the racket continues to come up. Again, you see the ball coming off the racket. The racket comes down low behind the ball. Now you begin to drop the racket as the ball is coming to your racket. You take a little 45 degree angle step. If you can, a lot of times you're forced too far backwards, but if you can, get that step in there and get the most important part is to get the racket under the ball. As you make contact again, you come up and you keep saluting all the way through. Now let's take a look at the shot in the actual motion. The retrieving part in lobbing and retrieving, if worked through with patience, also can become a significant factor in your game if done properly. A retrieve is simply a ball that's contacted above the waist off your opponent's overhead. That is, as you're forced backwards and you do make a pretty good lob, since your lob is so deep forcing him backwards, it's going to pretty much take a little bit off the strength of his overhead. So now he's going to be forced to hit a shorter overhead, allowing you to get the racket back and the, catching the ball at its highest point to hit down on the ball. When you're doing retrieving, you have to keep in mind, it's very difficult to do lobbing and retrieving on small courts. Courts generally with a bigger backspace 
favor more of these strokes like lobbing and retrieving. It gives you a chance to really set up for the stroke, to move behind the baseline, and really get prepared for the shot. Like lobbing and, and all the other game strokes, retrieving is started in the ready position. Okay, the first thing you want to do is you get the racket back here, above the hip this time. As the racket's taken back, you have to keep in mind that this shot is done with lots of anticipation. It's pretty much all anticipation. You have to be able to watch the ball clearly off your opponent's racket, off the overhead smash, watch the ball bounce shortly, and then you have to be able to take the ball on the rise as you come through, hitting in a downward motion. Watch. One, racket's back. You see the ball go up in the air. Your opponent contacts the ball. As the ball is bouncing, you start to move forward, 45 degree angle with the front foot. Your racket's still a little bit above your hip at this point. You want to try to catch the top half of the ball if you can. As the ball bounces, you're catching the top half. The ball's rising, and now you're hitting the top half of the ball, preferably at least 6 to 10 inches in front of your front shoulder, contacting over the ball, following through straight over. Now let me show you in full motion what a retrieve looks like. An approach shot is simply a ball that's contacted in the ground stroke position, but kind of like semi-crouched down. We learned the, th the two ready positions in the ground strokes were one, for the ground stroke, forehand and backhand, that we would hold the racket about waist level. The ready position for the volleys was held up about eye level. Both of them have kind of unique ways of holding the racket to make the shot a lot easier so you don't have to do a lot of extra techniques to get to the ball. In the approach shot, you want to start a little bit lower than usual. Remember, in, sing in the ground strokes, you're about right here. For the approach shot, you want to bend your knees slightly down and keep the racket still about waist level, but now you're in a semi-crouched position. This enables you to get to the same level as the ball. Remember, your opponent's serving a ball that's coming at you very high in speed and very low in depth, so you need to really get down low for this ball. So, keep the racket up, right here in the ready position, about waist level. Knees are slightly bent. You keep your eyes on the oncoming ball. As soon as you see the ball coming off your opponent's racket, the first position you'll be in is the backswing. Take the racket back at about a 45 degree angle, actually as if you're almost volleying a low volley, but you're really hitting an approach shot or a ground stroke. Take the racket back, the left arm swings around. Now it's very, very, very important at this point to make sure that you contact the ball in front of your front foot with your weight going forward. This'll, this will let you drive through the ball, causing that good momentum towards the net as you're approaching the, the net. Again, slightly bent, Racket's up in the ready position. You see the ball coming off your opponent's racket. Here comes the ball. The racket slides back at a 45 degree angle. The left hand slims around right here, just so it's actually almost going to catch the ball. You take that little short 45 degree angle step. Now, the contact has to be made 6 to 12 inches in front of your front foot. As you make your contact with the ball, you simply make the contact and come up in a flag saluting position. Again. Racket back, left hand around, short 45 degree angle step, left hand pulls away, contact with the ball in an upward motion, and now you'll be approaching that ready for your volley. Now, let me show you the shot in actual motion. The most important part of any paddle tennis strategy is to keep the ball in play as much as possible. The more times you keep the ball in play, the higher percentage of chances you have of winning the point. The basic double strategy for the serving team, the first thing you want to do is concentrate on making a good, hard, low, deep serve. Remember, we learned bounce, step, lean forward, and make contact with your serve. The reason you want to make the serve nice and low and deep is you want to try to force that serve to turn it backwards a little bit off balance. As you're approaching the net, remember the racket comes up, you're coming to the net, you've now reached the bucket line, your first volley. You want to make good, solid contact, either player hitting nice, very, very deep low shot, forcing the team back on the defensive. 
as the serving team approaches the net, now they're going to gain control by that good, hard, deep volley they hit. The second position in the double strategy concentrates a little bit more after you've made and been successful at your first volley. Now that the server or the short man has made a good, low, deep volley to the service returner, the service returner is now forced back on the defensive. Probably in this situation, because he's forced back so much, he's probably going to lob. In any case, when two players are at the net in the double strategy, one player or the player with the forehand in the middle becomes the dominant overhead player. Keep in mind, when this player is hitting the overhead, he becomes the communicator also. So as they're pushed back in the defensive and he sees the lob going up in the air, he watches the ball, he immediately yells, mine, or I got it, and as he backs up to hit the overhead, He's concentrating, now he spots the ball, he makes contact, comes to the net, back in the same original position, but now, now the roles are reversed. Notice that when the short man moved across the net, he moved directly right in front of the net. He didn't back up, he didn't sway away, he stayed right on the net in case the service returning team returns a good hard shot. The third and final position in the double strategy for the serving team is once you've been successful with your first volley from the bucket line and you've now forced your opponents on the defensive, it's very important to keep in mind while you've gained control of the net that you have to move properly when at the net. Sometimes when you hit a good, low, hard, deep volley, yes, you do force your opponent backwards, but also often because of the nature of the court so small, you force them off the court as well. So at this point, you want to cut off as many short angles as you can. It's no problem giving them that low percentage shot. That's a very, very difficult shot in paddle tennis to achieve. So as I make my first volley deep, I'm at the net, I force them off the court. My partner now is watching down the line while I become the dominant player in the middle, again, leaving that angle. Just remember to keep in mind that the nature of the court is very small. So when both players are at the net, they pretty much have a full coverage of the whole court. The first thing you want to know for the receiving team as part of the double strategy is to remember that any time your partner's spread off the court, you must move with them. When the server's getting ready to serve, you're lining up in this position. The server serves the ball very wide, forcing my partner off the court, let's say two feet. At this point, I have to be able to move with him, watching the ball at all times. As my partner makes his service return, I'm moving back in to the middle of the court here this is the position that you want to end in. The second position for the receiving team concentrates a little bit more now on the service return. A good low hard service return by the receiving team sets up an excellent poaching opportunity. The service returner should be concentrating first on watching the ball coming out of his opponent's racket, then making good solid contact with the ball in a forward motion. It's very important that when he makes his contact, he's moving forward. At this point, the poacher continues to watch the oncoming ball back into his partner's racket and then back again. Remember, on the service return, a lot of times what separates the, the better players from the lower players that don't improve that much is a good, hard, low, consistent service return. Also, the service return is one of the most important shots of the game, again, setting up that excellent poaching opportunity. The third and final position for the receiving team concentrates mostly on that poaching opportunity we talked about earlier. Once your partner has been successful with his good, consistent, low, hard service return, that poacher takes that aggressive first step forward, now putting pressure on the serving team to make that good, solid, low, hard, deep volley by the poacher. In a sense, the poacher at this point is forcing them to make that volley by them. It puts a lot of strain and pressure under the volleying team. But remember, when you make your poach, it's contacted in a downward motion into your opponent's side of the court. I've just given you the 10 basic lessons of paddle tennis, lessons you need to learn to become a complete player. If you practice conscientiously, you can learn this game effectively. But really, most important, you should have fun with it. Make paddle tennis an enjoyable part of your life like I have. I'll see you on the courts.